good to be together this morning. I'm grateful for the opportunity to come together and open up God's word for a moment and pray that we might have some things that will be encouraging and helpful. And in just a moment, we want to take a further look at that demonstration of, of really what Jesus described as impressive faith. It, it truly was something that he marveled at. And, and that says something when God marvels at anything. Uh, that's something for, for us to take a look at and pay attention and see what, what was so impressive about that that God himself would, would note that. And, and to kind of set the stage for why that is so impressive, there, there, there's a whole host of things that we can look at in the scriptures of individuals that really thought they were something, that thought that they had something that was so impressive that they thought in some ways maybe was even more worthy at looking at them than God. And yet how many times God had to uh, put them kind of in a place of showing that they were on dangerous territory, dangerous places to eg exalt themselves in any way and think that something that they had done or something that they had achieved was actually more impressive than the things that, that God had done or were attributed to God. And we're going to look at a couple of those examples. One is, is Nebuchadnezzar. It's a kind of an interesting uh, example of an individual who truly did, I'm sure, by... by man's standards by the things that we measure ourselves and what, what impresses us and what oppresses others. What, what, what would make someone kind of stop as they're kind of driving by and maybe say, wait a minute, I want to take a closer look at that and see, uh, you know, what, what, what is, uh, what is uh, uh, amazing and what is uh, worth noting and what is saying that this is truly impressive. And, and Nebuchadnezzar had it all. Nebuchadnezzar had built up quite an impressive kingdom. It was something that he himself was saying, this when I step back and I look at it, it's like, it's just, I can't believe uh, that, that I, I'm the guy that's kind of in charge of all this, who's, who's responsible for all of this. And we're just kind of taking it in. And you notice in Daniel chapter 4, we see this example of this mindset. And again, it's something that's, that could be very, very common. It, it, can all, it can take all of us sometimes by surprise. And, 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 and we can kind of fall into that, that mindset of just looking around at the things that have our, our name on them or things that... that go back to, to showing something about our talent or our ability. And Nebuchadnezzar truly, and as we said, when we come to, to, to things that, that men have done that, that truly would be worth noting or writing about or, or mentioning in any shape, Nebuchadnezzar had quite the resume. And in Daniel chapter 4, I want to start reading in verse 28. In Daniel chapter 4, verse 28, it says, All this happened... ...to Nebuchadnezzar the king. He says, 12 months later, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king reflected and said, is this not Babylon the great? And it truly was. It was amazing. Uh, there, there really was nothing comparable to it. Babylon was just absolutely a, a, a wonder to behold. In terms of what man's capable of, the, the beauty, the splendor, the richness, the vastness... He really did. You have to give him credit because he did. He, he, he had made something, he had achieved something that so many few people were able to, to be in his category. He was a man among other people. And he's noting this and look at this. And, he, and it's almost as, a, as if, you know, kind of the way we used to do, we get so busy and we get so caught up in, in, in the hustle and bustle of daily life. Sometimes we don't even realize maybe what we're truly accomplishing. And he just kind of takes a, a moment. He's walking around and says, look at all this. This really is amazing. He's almost imp he's impressing himself almost. And he says, is this not Babylon the great? Notice he says, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power for the glory of my majesty. And he gets just caught up in it. And I can imagine it would be very tempting to get caught up in, in something like that. Because he's, he's right. In other words, he says, all this stuff has my name written all over it. And people for years and years to come, when they think of Babylon, they're going to think Nebuchadnezzar. And they're going to talk about all the things that, that, that he was able to, to achieve, that, that surpassed what achievements so many others had had. And then all of a sudden, God comes into the picture. And... God comes in the picture in verse 31. It says, while the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, 
To you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you. And you will be driven away from mankind. And your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle. And seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize... This is interesting. Until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. If you have forgotten, you are just a servant. You have forgotten. You didn't really. This isn't for anything you have done. Look at how easy it was. He just sat so caught up in it because it was. It was, he no doubt, he, his intellect and his ability and his strength and his kingdom and his majesty were responsible for all of these things. But then how quickly God got moved out of the picture. And so God is trying really to help him by humbling him in this way. And he does. It actually does help Nebuchadnezzar come to his senses later and realize, yeah, I, I was out of line. I really got ahead of myself. But it's interesting how, how we, we're going to see this a pattern for mankind. Tends, we tend to struggle with this. And Nebuchadnezzar was no different. And so God was going to help him realize that you need to realize your place. That really, I'm the one responsible for this. And therefore, God deserves the glory. Another individual that God was not impressed with, but this individual thought that people should be impressed with, was Sennacherib. Sennacherib, the king of Assyria there in Isaiah chapter 37. He also was an individual who just, he got caught up in, in, in all the, the, the things that he had been uh, successful with. And again, he gets caught kind of, uh, what is the word that caught monologuing? They say, uh, I think it's that, that, that movie, The Incredibles, <laughs> the evil guy gets caught monologuing about all of his things. And in the, middle, <laughs> in the middle of it, God decides he's going to cut him down in the middle of actually talking about all the things that, that he's truly impressed with. But they're in Isaiah chapter 37. In I, Isaiah chapter 37, notice in verse 21, it says, Then Isaiah the son of Amos sent word to Hezekiah saying, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, because you have prayed to me about Sennacherib, king of Assyria. So here's Sennacherib, king of Assyria. And he himself has an impressive kingdom. And he starts going on about it. And this is what he says. In verse 22, he says, this is the word that the Lord has spoken against him. She has despised you and mocked you, the virgin daughter of Zion, she has shaken her head behind you, the daughter of Jerusalem, whom you have reproached and blasphemed, and against whom have you raised your voice and haughtily lifted up your eyes against the Holy One of Israel. Through your servant, you have reproached the Lord, and you have said, notice what he says, with my many chariots, I came up to the heights of the mountains, to the remotest parts of Lebanon, and I cut down its tall cedars and its choice cypresses. And I will go to its highest peak, its thickest forest. I dug wells and drank waters. And with the sole of my feet, I dried up all the rivers of Egypt. Again, no doubt impressive things that no one else had really been able to succeed. But, but he did. And because of these, he said, these weren't just easy feats either. He said, I went to the highest peak of the mountain. I got to the highest level you could ever achieve. And I did things that no one else thought that anybody else would ever think is possible. And so it just, it, it was so tempting for him to continue to kind of, he looks at it and he, again, he looks to himself and he's kind of beating his chest a little bit and just kind of feeling very, very accomplished. And it's interesting, God, God response to this um, back up a few chapters Isaiah chapter 10 in Isaiah chapter 10 it's an interesting way how God responds in Isaiah chapter 10 beginning in verse 12 it says so it will be that when the Lord has completed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem he will say I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the Hump of his haughtiness. For he has said, by the power of my hand,
man, and by the, my wisdom I did this, for I have understanding. And I removed the boundaries of the peoples and plundered their treasures. And like a mighty man, I brought down their inhabitants. And my hand reached to the riches of the peoples like a nest. And as one gathers abandoned eggs, I gathered all the earth. And there was not one that flapped its wing or opened its beak or chirped. But he's comparing himself, kind of just walking through the woods and the other kingdoms that uh, might have some reason to break. I was just like picking up net, like <laughs> abandoned eggs and just picked them and put them in my pocket. And all these people, they're, they're, they're literally in my pocket. I have control over them, and I just plucked them up, and nobody did a thing. They didn't even chirp. They were so terrified of everything that I did. And then God has a, a response to this. In verse 15, this is God's response. He says, is the axe to boast itself over the one who chops with it? He said, did, did you do all these things? I think I was the one who was doing it, and you were merely a, merely a tool in my hand. In other words, what God is going to say is, I think the accurate description is you're just like a rusty old rake, and I'm just going to toss you aside when I'm done with you. <laughs> that's, that's really the truth, is that you're just a tool, and you could have done none of these things unless I empowered, unless it was my will, unless I desired to use and choose and empower and strengthen and put all these things in you. You are nothing but a tool. And when I'm done with you, I will discard of you. And that's what he's saying to him. And in fact, he said that he will discard of him because he's not giving him the proper honor and the proper glory. So notice in verse 15, he says, Is the axe to boast itself over the one who chops with it? Is the saw to exalt itself over the one who wields it? That would be like a club wielding those who lift it. Or like a rod, lifting him who is not wood. Therefore the Lord, the God of hosts, will send a wasting disease among his stout warriors. And under his glory, a fire will be kindled like a burning flame. And then one more we'll look at again. That an individual who thought he had much reason to be impressive was the prince of Tyre. The prince of Tyre over in Ezekiel chapter 28. We can see some of his statements of his achievements. And notice in the very first chapter of Ezekiel, or in chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28, beginning in verse 1. It says, The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, say to the leader of Tyre, Thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up and you have said, this is what he said, he actually said, I am a God. I'm a God. People are going to worship my strength and my wisdom and my know-how. I sit in the seat of God's in the heart of the seas. He's feeling pretty good about himself. And this is what God says. God says, yet... You are a man and not God. Although you make your heart like the heart of God, and behold, and notice, and he goes on this. Now, I can understand why, because there were some great things he did do. There were, and, and God's given a note his, his accomplishments. Notice what he does. He goes through his resume. And God says, yeah, you, you have done some great things. Notice in verse 3, he says, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that is a match for you. By your wisdom and understanding, you have acquired riches for yourself. You have acquired gold and silver for your treasuries. By your great wisdom, by your trade, you have increased your riches. And your heart is lifted up because of your riches. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have made your heart like the heart of God, therefore... Behold, I will bring strangers upon you, the most ruthless of the nations. And they will draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They will bring you down to the pit and you will die the death of those who are slain in the heart of the sea. This is, God's really coming down. In other words, 
the imagery is almost like, he says, this is, here's you saying you're a God, saying you're all these things, all these conferences. The reality is God's going to have his foot on your chest, and he's going to have his sword drawn. And he's going to say, I, I think I'm the God. <laughs> but I, I think I'm the one who's God. That, notice what he says. He says in verse 10, you will die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken, declares the Lord God. And notice what he says. He says in verse 11, again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a limitation from the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, you had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. And notice he goes on and on, because no doubt that's what happened. He, he just got so caught up, and yes, there were great, mighty achievements, but he forgot to place the honor in the proper realm. And this is just a few samples, and on and on, we see many kings fall into this. And so for me, when I look, when we get to the New Testament, and we see in Luke chapter 7, does that not impress us? No wonder Jesus says, I have not seen faith like that, not even in Israel. And there's a reason why, because this is a man who has many achievements. This is not some guy who says, well, I don't know what I have to brag about because I really haven't done anything. This guy has done a lot of things. In fact, he's done so many things in Israel that the people who bring the request to Jesus said, Jesus, you have to go to him. And then I remember what they said, they said, he is worthy for you to come to him. He is impressive in the, in, the, in the area where he lives. He's done all kinds of things that people have sung his praises. And so we go over there to Luke chapter 7. And again, listen to the accolades and the, the, re, the reaction of the people who tell Jesus why he needs to go. Luke chapter 7 verse 1 says, When he had completed all his discourse in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum and a centurion slave who was highly regarded by him, was sick and about to die. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him to come and save the life of his slave. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly implored him, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this to him, for he loves our nation. And it was he who built us our synagogue. In other words, the people are singing his praises. They're saying, he's got his name on that. You know that synagogue that's out there? His name's right there. He did it. And so Jesus goes. Jesus, and all this is almost like, by, by reading it, almost says, well, I have to go. He's this, he's this kind of guy. And then Jesus gets stopped in his tracks. Because Jesus was there when he heard the mouth of, Ze of Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, it was Jesus, the word of God, who spoke to Nebuchadnezzar and said, I'm sorry, but I don't think you, you know who you're talking to. I'm not impressed. <laughs> Jesus is the word of God that spoke to Sennacherib. That said, I don't think you know who you're talking to. I think you've forgotten who really is in control. I'm not impressed with you. It was Jesus who was there, the word of God who spoke to the prince of Tyre. Who gives this amazing imagery. I'm literally going to draw a sword and say, who's the God? I think we've forgotten our place. This Jesus stops and he says, I'm impressed now. <laughs> because listen to what he says. This is a guy who has many accomplishments. Many people praise him. Many people love him. Many people honor him. And yet notice what he says in verse 6. Jesus starts on his way with them, and when he is not far from the house, the centurion sends friends saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy. Many people would d disagree with that. What do you mean you're not worthy? You're kidding me, all the stuff you've done, all the things that we acknowledge you for, 
Yes, that's why we sent him to you. And amazing, notice what he says. He says, do not trouble yourself, for, the, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. Yes, the roof that I built, I'm not worthy for you to look at anything I've done. I don't want you standing there and me having to shamefully sit there and say, yeah, yeah these are my accomplishments. Because you know what he's going to say? He says, compared to me, I can't do half of what you do. There's not a single thing I could do in this world. The highest mountain, the highest building, the highest synagogue I could ever... I could have the most splendid synagogue just glittering with gold. And he says, it would be absolutely nothing compared to the power you possess. He says, because I know if you just say the word, you can make my servant well again. And he acknowledges this power. Notice verse 7. He says, for this reason, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now, when Jesus heard this notice, he marveled. That's an impressive line in Scripture. Jesus marveled. That should make us pay attention because when you have countless men saying, look what I've done, look what I've done, he says, are you kidding me? You've done nothing. And all of a sudden, God stops and says, look at this. What is he looking at? What is he, what is he telling you and I to look at, to praise, to be in awe of? It is this. When we truly see ourselves in truth and simplicity, that regardless of anything we may have done to our name, we are nothing compared to God. What that also does, that lets us speedily and readily and quickly See how much we need God and how much we're willing to depend on God. In other words, all of these other individuals that we can see in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, why was God so hard on them? Why did he come down so hard on them? It was for this reason. If you continue to exalt yourself and, and will not allow you to see the, the vast humility of your, your existence compared to who God is, you'll never think to come to him. And in, in the end, that's what God wants. God wants us to come to him. God wants us to plead to him. Why? Because we need him. We can't go through this life without him. We can't go through this world with him. But too many times we get tempted and we start looking at our resume and we start looking at these things. And what happens is it blinds us. And what it does is it distorts the reality of who we are. And we start beginning to lessen and dim. We, we dim the switch on the glory of God. And we want the spotlight sometimes. It's, it shines too much on us. And the real reason God tries to ex expose that because all we're doing is distancing ourselves even further. And we're getting ourselves further and further in trouble. And it's a dangerous thing because we don't even think we're in danger. Because we'll, well, look at what I've done. Look at all the things we've done. I don't need God. And nothing could be further from the truth. And what Jesus marvels at is he goes to the right source immediately with humility with awe and with wonder, because that's the only way we're going to make it. God is worthy of this. But you know what's amazing? God doesn't go on bra bragging about it. God doesn't go on telling people about how amazing he is. He simply just is. We're going to talk about it tonight. He is, his name is I am. I just, I just am. He just is, and we need to acknowledge that. And what he's hoping is that when the eyes and faith and, and reality, when we see God for who he is, it should also be a striking reflection of who we are. 
And it should minimize us and drop us and lower us to such a point that we realize, who are we compared to him? And then what it does, it, there's another sense of awe because this same God who's so far superior than us, what does he do? He humbles himself. He goes to a cross. He dies for us. And he says, I want you to be seated in a place of honor. Yes, I want you. The reason Jesus died for us is he, get this, he wants to exalt you. But it will never happen. It will never happen while we go on thinking that we are the ones who need to be exalted first. And we will be brought low. We will be destroyed. We will lose we will gain nothing. But if we humble ourselves like this centurion, I am nothing. <laughs> oh, it's amazing that you are even willing to talk to someone like me. What happens is Jesus then offers his hand and he, will, and he offers us to accept him. That we might be brought high. But let's, continue, let's finish this. I want to look at two other passages and we'll end our lesson. But go back there to Luke chapter 7. Look, look how this ends. Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse, or the end of verse 8. He says, I am nothing compared to you because I, I'm a man with authority, but it's nothing compared to yours. My authority is laughable, is what he's saying. Nobody should ever look at me for anything, for any reason, and any honor. I just strip my badges and just get rid of them. Think about what he's saying. I should take all of my badges and all of my medals, and I should just strip them right now and throw them away because they're nothing compared to who you are. You have real authority. You know what that sounds like? It sounds like the people in heaven, the creatures in heaven who have seen Jesus, who have seen his power and his glory. You know what they do? They say the exact same thing. They say, let's cast our crowns. Anything worthy of honor we have, we throw it to you and we want you to wear it because Jesus is just that glorious. He is just that mighty. He is just that powerful. That go over there to Revelation and, and notice that in its beauty and its splendor, what, what the... Those who see Jesus say in Revelation chapter 4. Notice in verse 4, it says, Around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments, and golden crowns were on their heads. And notice what these people say. It says in verse 8, Day and night, they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. He is the I Am. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him, who sits on the throne and will worship him, who lives forever and ever, and notice, and will cast their crowns before him, saying, worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. Well, what's his will? What's his will? was so that Jesus might put on a human body, and yes, in amazing fashion, in more glory and in more perfection than any of us could ever dare to do, to walk perfectly on this earth. He then went to the cross, and he died for our sins. To do what? Turn to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. To what? To belittle us? To mock us? To throw it in our face? Get this. Why, did, why does he want us to acknowledge that? This is amazing. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. But God. Compared to who? Us sinners. Yeah, that's what the first four verses are. Look at us. 
This is us. We're a bunch of sinners. <laughs> We're a bunch of unworthy sinners. That's who we are. That's the title we get. That's about as accurate as it's ever going to get. But <laughs> God, what? Being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And notice verse 6, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In other words, he wants us to be in the closest position because he knows how much we need him. And he says, I will be available. We will never experience that in its splendor or the way it was intended unless we accept who we are. Accept through the words of Nebuchadnezzar, Prince of Tyre, Sennacherib. Let's not be fooled by who we really are. God wants us to stay in that place because he wants us what to exalt us in due time. And that exaltation is the idea of letting us be able to sit at his table and feast from his grace. So yes, it is truly amazing thing this, this centurion did. It truly is worth marveling at. Because a man who had so much to be praised about literally looked at it and said, I'm not worthy for you even to come and take a look at it. And by Humbling himself, he so quickly drew near to ask God for help. And Jesus was willing to honor him and exalt him by giving him his power and, and, and bestowing it upon him. That's the place Jesus wants us to be in. But we will only ever get there. We will only ever truly experience it unless we accept by our own act of humility. Truly, God is the only thing worth, the only one worth any praise or adoration. But isn't it amazing that in his love and in his grace and in his mercy, he doesn't wish to exult over us. He wishes to bestow grace on us and lift us up that we might share his glory with him. If anyone is with us who's never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, we encourage you that you would truly, yes, humble yourself. Humble yourself. Yes, accept the title. Accept it. Let's not look at any of the good things you've done. Let's not look at any of the achievements. Because at the end of the day, we are sinners. We are sinners in need of cleansing. And when we can see that, and then see the God who others cast their crown before in honor and praise, see him humble himself, and endure the suffering on the cross. It makes us truly appreciate what great love he has for us. And what it truly does is make us realize with what humility God exerts his glory. And that is worth praising. That is worth aligning ourselves to. Because he simply wishes to then exalt us and put us in a wonderful place where we have, can put our past behind us, where we can be exalted to say our sins are cleansed. And to say we're Christians now, not, not, not condemned sinners. If anyone is accepting that, yes, you need that, and, and recognize that through faith Jesus is willing to offer that to you, won't you in faith just simply accept it and confess that, yes, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and confessing that simply in faith, obey. Obey the gospel. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. To die to the things of this world, namely the things worthy of praise in this world. Die to that because they're, not, they're nothing compared to God. Die to living for those things. And truly say God is the only one worth exalting and praising. And live for him that he might exalt and praise and, and, and lift you up. Cleansing you from sin. Lavishing you with his love and his grace. And one day letting you reign with him forever in heaven. What, if this is you, if, you, if this is where 
you're at, we encourage you to come obey the gospel. If you've already done these things but need prayer or encouragement in some way to be faithful to him, whatever the case is, won't you come and we'll gladly help assist you while we sing this song of encouragement together. Come and obey the gospel.